Isn't that funny? When you get Stuff. old, and I can tell you this, Kelly, because Kelly's less, mo, more than half my age. Yes, more than half my age. Um, when you get old, you you have this amazing memory for stuff that happened in oh, probably the first 15, 20 years of your life. And after that, it's all just a sort of a haze. Um, and the remarkable thing I discovered uh, as I my parents got into the 80s, Dad's still alive. Good God, he's 91. He'll be 92 still. But um, the amazing thing is he can tell you, you know, what he had for breakfast on the 3rd of February, 1947. But he couldn't tell you. <laughs> he couldn't tell you what he had for breakfast that morning. So, you know, it's, it's, I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to having a minute detail of my childhood. Well, I suppose it depends if you had a good childhood or not, to be perfectly honest with you. Uh, I was raised in a state house area over there called Desol 1. It sure as hell, Desol 1 now. Quarter of Harper Street and Kauri, they, they call it now. We just call it Kauri. The, the tree Kauri, the tree Kauri. Um, the corner of um, Harper and Kauri Street in a state house, uh, in, uh, in a state housing area, in actual fact, in Monganui in the 1960s, when I suspect most New Zealanders, um, oh, a huge number of us, hundreds of thousands of us, possibly millions, uh, have been raised over the years in state houses. Um, and they were one of those innovations, one of that sort of paternalistic government. Uh, the first state house was 1930s. Um, I remember Mickey Joseph, I don't remember, I wasn't there, but I remember seeing footage of Mickey Joseph Savage carrying in, uh, it was think, it's from, from memory, this is pretty good actually, it's either in Berenpore or Miramar, so it's in your neck of the woods, Kelly, it was either in Berenpore or Miramar where the first state house was built, and there is, a, there is, a, there is sort of newsreel footage of Michael Joseph Savage carrying in um, a chair, uh, just for the cameras, obviously, and they didn't carry it anymore. Um, but nevertheless, and mm, for those of you who don't know, Michael Joe Savage was the first Labour Prime Minister of this country um, and is widely credited with... Um, Seddon was with, recredited with set up the welfare state, but Mickey Joseph Savage gave it the sort of afterburners. Well, and I never, I'm sure he didn't anticipate that the welfare state would look like this, uh, what, almost 90 years later. Nevertheless, um, one of the things that does come out of state housing is this concept of a benign government, a benign paternalistic government um, who, who plans um, and plans, plans a pace. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah, that plans for New Zealand. Um, and that is, um, as a result of that, they, um, they, they, they had this sort of benign view that New Zealanders couldn't entirely be trusted with individual choice, that on big stuff, and housing was one of them, New Zealand need to have a plan and then needed to have it enacted. And that's pretty much what's driven all our public services when you think about over the years, public health, obviously, uh, immunisation and inoculation programs. Uh, what else? Oh, obviously education. Um, all those things have a nice, kind state, a paternalistic state that to a large extent um, provides for all, all of us, provides for all of us um, some degree of certainty and planning. Um, that all went out the window in the late 80s with the Rogernomics and Ruthonomics revolution, late 80s, early 90s. And the idea was that the state should be as withered and as small as possible and people should be able to get on with stuff and that the market should hold sway. So the sort of mixed economy that existed before the late 80s was, was now going to be dominated by the more market concept that the private enterprise should look after things and on they would move. And at the moment, that's one of the reasons why we've got so many problems, it has to be said, um, over the last, uh, what, two d decade and a half, decade of the late, of the 20th century, first 20 years of this country, we've got a state sector that doesn't appear to be paternalistic. It doesn't appear to care anymore. Um, that's adopted a whole series of, if you like, private enterprise concepts, uh, improving, including paying chief executives and middle managers a crap load of money and holds none of them accountable when they make a mistake. Um, and at the same time, we've got an individual, a private sector that is rapacious, um, now more foreign owned than it's ever been in the history of New Zealand. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, yes, more foreign owned than it's ever been in the history of New Zealand. Uh, and seek, simply seeks to repatriate the profits 
by gouging New Zealanders, whether it's a, a, a government-owned corporate like Air New Zealand or whether it's, um, you know, New Zealand aluminium smelters or forestry companies on the East Coast or whatever. Um, it's been a tough time. I, I say that because overnight last night um, there is a... Uh, and here we are being told and, you know, the inefficiency of state planning combined with the rapacity or the selfishness of the private sector, particularly of the corporate private sector I'm talking about here. Um, one of, Consumer New Zealand has done an investigation into, and I don't know if you've caught up with this, into hybrid and electrical vehicle cars. Um, and they've done that because they wanted to test um, whether or not uh, hybrid cars um, and those plug-in hybrids, um, PHEVs they call them, um, are, are any more efficient than um, petrol cars or diesel cars. And they've tested the uh, manufacturer's fuel efficiency for cars that are here. Now, as you know, there's uh, significant government support uh, in terms of setting up a, what we call the ute tax or a tax for all um, uh, petrol and diesel vehicles for the future of new ones. Um, and then also there is this dispensation for hybrid or this, if you like, subsidy for hybrid and electrical vehicles being available to us if you buy a new one. Aren't you lucky if you've got that money? Well, Consumer New Zealand have tested their, the new cars, the plug-in hybrids, against their manufacturer's claims by simply driving them around Wellington, which is a fair enough, and then taking them over the Rimataka Hill. And um, they discovered, and you might have seen it last night, that essentially plug-in hybrid manufacturers are just liars. Um, incredibly, incredible liars. Um, to give you a couple of examples, they found that the Kia Nero, I must admit I've never seen one, don't know what it looks like, it's probably just a Wellington car, who knows, um, used more than double um, the, um, uh, the, the, the petrol that its manufacturer claimed. And the Hyundai Ionic, which is ironic because it's spelled with a Q, um, used up 92% more um, than the manufacturer of petrol than the manufacturer claimed it would use. And when it came to fully hybrid vehicles, the common you used Toyota Yaris um, saw the biggest discrepancy. It was up 44% on the 3.6 uh, litres per 100 kilometres it was estimated to use. So, you know, Kia Nero, Hyundai Onik, um, Toyota Yaris, probably three of the most popular cars in New Zealand um, of that sort of variety, complete crap. Um, not efficient, not effective at all, uh, and um, don't meet their manufacturer's claims um, as to fuel efficiency and manufacturing. Now, the really interesting thing for me is, um, and uh, again, we talk about this concept of a nine state. Here we have the government, and in my view, rightly, so I've got no product problem with the therapeutic products bill, which is designed to see whether or not stuff that we eat um, meets the specifications and the claims of the manufacturers. No problem with that. That's fair enough. If you're claiming to have a health benefit from something that you're selling, it's a good idea to be able to prove that it does exactly that. That's cool. Not a problem. But here we have that bill going through Parliament, and yet here we have government just ignoring, indeed almost shepherding us and herding us to manufacturers who are making false claims about fuel efficiency from hybrid um, and plug-in hybrid vehicles. Um, so, you, you know, and, and what's the government doing? It took Consumer New Zealand, which is, as you know, an independent and um, a voluntary organisation, um, sort of an NGO, really, um, to actually expose this. Wouldn't you have thought that that was the first job of, you know, the Commerce Commission? or the Ministry of Business Enterprise, uh, Innovation and Enterprise, M MB, wouldn't you thought that was their job to protect us from this and these false claims? But I oh, know. Um, so I raised that issue this morning because it, it seems to me that um, the government has, um, and I'm not saying this government necessarily, but um, the civil servants that run governments, um, have their enemies and they have their friends. Um, the enemies they go after uh, and their friends they leave alone, yet they're guilty of the same false claims. Seems odd, don't you think? Um, 0800 33 2283. 0800 33 2283. Um, and um, if you need to text on these issues, the text is 50 50. All right. Um, now, the issues I do want to talk about. Oh, big story that's just broken this morning. Um, you remember when the Ukraine Russian war broke out? Of course you do. Uh, 13 months ago now, I think. Oh, a little about 12 months ago, really. I shouldn't exaggerate. Um, 
I'm not a manufacturer of a hybrid vehicle, so I won't. Um, the when the um, uh, war broke out, um, one of the big sort of fears and qualms, um, particularly from the Germans, as I remember, but it was sort of expressed throughout the world, and it was going to affect us all, in a, even in New Zealand, in a deleterious way was that the Russian pipeline, the gas pipeline, uh, what do they call it, Nord Stream? And then there was going to be a Nord Stream 2 uh, that made most of Central Europe dependent upon Russian gas. Um, that that was going, that was blown up. Do you remember? Um, and sort of, it was in the Baltic Sea, I think, in the sea between Sweden and Denmark, somewhere around about there. And it was blown up and sabotaged. And um, everybody stayed... Everybody sort of blamed everybody else. I can remember being on this program and Paul Brent with Paul Brennan, and he was saying he was blaming the Americans, uh, and um, and and I think the, the British were blaming the Russians. Um, and anyhow, there was a whole series of blames. Well, the New York Times has just published this morning that intelligence suggests that, in actual fact, the Ukraine did it. <laughs> yes, it wasn't the Americans. And in actual fact, it's the United States intelligence that have kindly worked it out because they were bamboozled as well. They knew they hadn't done it. <laughs> the CIA knew it wasn't them, but they couldn't quite work out who else it was. Um, they, um, so uh, the US officials now suggesting that a pro-Ukrainian group carried out the attack on the Nord Stream pipelines last year. Um, a step towards determining responsibility for an act of sabotage that's confounded investigators on both sides of the land, well, ever since it really happened. Um, the US officials say that there's no evidence, uh, you know, I, li I like this, there's no evidence that President Vladimir Zelensky of Ukraine or his top lieutenants were involved or that the perpetrators were acting at the direction of, of the Ukrainian government, but that's all they say. There is no evidence that they've found thus far. But there you go. You see? Ah. It was the Ukrainians. And who would have thought? They were, nobody would have thought they had that capability, that concept, that, that ability to do it. But there they were. And you know now why they did it, don't you? Yeah, well, gosh, the Germans won't be happy, will they? But that story has just broken this morning in the New York Times, by the way. All right, now, um, what are we going to talk about today? Do you have, and if you're a woman, sort of disregard this, toxic masculinity? <laughs> ah, yes. I was introduced to the concept of toxic masculinity, ironically, by my daughter last year, about this time, who gave a speech at school. Um, and her speech topic that she had chosen was toxic masculinity. Um, now, she was 17 at the time. She was in year 13 at the time. Uh, rotary, um, which is largely composed of men, but not exclusively anymore, um, actually hosted the speech competition, um, and she participated in it. Um, she came home very happy one day. I think she had about $100 or something and a sort of certificate or something like that. She said, I won. And I went, oh, really? Good God. What was the competition like? What was your, no, what was your topic like? Toxic masculinity. To which I sort of looked at her archly sideways and said, Were you, was it a speech on your father? To which she said, no, 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 sort of, I thought, hesitatingly. Um, said, no, 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 it was just that it's something that, you know, and then she mentioned for the first time somebody I'd never heard of uh, by the name of Andrew Tate. Um, and I thought, phew, I've escaped that particular and direct responsibility. Um, but toxic masculinity is essentially um, the phrase, and Radio New Zealand, uh, being what Radio New Zealand are, have got a whole series of women recently um, who've run programs, um, well, as recently as this week, actually, um, on the toxic world of the manosphere. A sort of argument that um, men um, are being influenced, particularly young men and boys, by social media influencers like Andrew Tate, um, who's banged up in Romania at the moment in jail, um, for those of you who don't know. Now, I don't know Andrew Tate. Um, I've got no idea who he is. Um, I've only heard of him because he appears on the news and, um, you know, I, it is not in my milieu. I don't tend to go to any of his sites. In fact, I wouldn't have known him until my daughter made that speech a year ago. 
And she said, you realise that Theo watches Andrew Tate, don't you? And of course, I didn't and felt shamed as a consequence of not knowing what my then 13-year-old son was watching because I don't, as a general rule, check his social media. And I suppose I should. But then I'm just an average parent. Um, Andrew Tate is a former kickboxer. He's now been arrested for sex trafficking um, in Romania. Uh, and he's been deplatformed by most of the forums on which he was a key influencer. Um, YouTube, TikTok, uh, what else is there out there? I guess Facebook, I don't know, Telegram, a whole series of social media sites that are out there um, upon which he had a devoted following. Um, he promoted himself as being socially, economically and sexually successful uh, as a role model uh, and suggested uh, and fostered a perception that men, well, and here's the question, is it a perception or is it the reality, that men are losing power and status in modern society. And in essence, you might like to think that Andrew Tate and his ilk really are arguing that boys and young men don't know who they are anymore. And in a funny sort of way, Andrew Tate was saying, we are men, we are masculine. We, are, we have a relationship with a woman that is not the same as a woman with a woman. We are born men, they are born women, ipso facto. Ta-da. Different roles, different um, physiological factors. Mm. Must come as a surprise to some. And also, more importantly, different psychological drivers as well. Now, I think I'm summing that up in a relatively benign way, um, but nevertheless, uh, Andrew Tate was one of the great influences um, of the last two years, three years in this country. And as I said, um, there are tons, literally, scores. No, there would be thousands, perhaps tens of thousands of young New Zealand boys um, who would know exactly who he is and have caught one or two of his videos, some um, possibly even embraced his um, ideology. Now, I can't see any proof, and I can't see any proof, that the Andrew Tates of this world are having any degree of influence upon New Zealand boys. But I do raise the issue here, and, and that is, um, and Radio New Zealand, and as you would expect, all the again, all the articles being written by women, um, have argued essentially that Andrew Tate is horrible, should be expunged, and is, have introduced this concept of toxic masculinity. Now, you can do a bit of, they even, they even put out a test for you to check whether or not you are masculinely to toxic. I'll give you a little, a couple of, a couple of questions at the moment to see if you fit that if you're a man. But I'm, I'm interested in that concept because it seems to me that one of the reasons that young boys or young men in New Zealand might search out the so-called toxic influences is because they do feel that their role um, is under threat or they don't know who they are as a gender. Um, can I give an example? Uh, my son hasn't had a male secondary school teacher until this year. Um, he is now 14. Um, but all through his primary school, all of his teachers were women. N without, without exception, they were women. Now, the other interesting thing about this is though that they were all women, and I met most of them, they were all women that dealt with their kids on not just um, a teaching level, but also sought to deal with them on an emotional level, all right? So Theo was encouraged as a young boy to have not simply a teacher-pupil relationship with his teacher, but also to understand that he had emotional responsibilities to others in the classroom, and um, he was encouraged in a relatively emotional way. Um, now, what was he encouraged to do? Well, in some ways, become a little girl. Um, Theo was just an ordinary little boy. I use him as an example. I think he's probably not entirely ordinary, obviously. But he's ordinary in one sense, and that is he's ordinary in the sense that he is a physical kid. He likes to go outside and run around. Um, you'd need to burn a bit of energy off him. Um, he likes boundaries. Um, he needs to know where the boundary is. 
And he also needs to know that if he crosses that boundary on the other side and just on the other side, like an inch over it, there is a consequence. And if he really crosses over it, the consequences get worse, not better. Um, he also needs to learn, learn things like um, if you tell the truth and you're, you get into trouble and you tell the truth, you won't get as punished as much as if you don't. All right. So if you lie after you've been caught doing something wrong, then there's a greater consequence. So he likes these sort of boxes. And in a funny sort of way, what I guess I'm describing to you is a traditional boys' school in this country. Um, a King's, uh, an Auckland Grammar, a Palmerston North Boys' High School, um, a Christchurch Boys' High School, an Otago Boys' High School. I guess what I'm describing to you are schools in which young boys are progressed to become young men. Um, and they are done so by suggesting that there is a series. And they're mostly taught, not exclusively taught, but they're primarily taught by men. And, when the, and their emotional bond is not so much with the teacher necessarily um, in the classroom, but it's connected in a lots of ways, whether it's in acting a school play, uh, oh, I don't know, um, you know, playing in the first 11 or the first 15, some form of sport, or alternatively, um, being impassioned by a teacher to explore a particular subject, whatever it might be, physics, chemistry, English, history, geography, whatever. Um, but I, I raised this issue this morning because, and there seems to be now a view that New Zealand boys and young New Zealand men are in trouble, aided and abetted this view by obviously the mainstream media. And I'm just looking at, you know, Radio New Zealand, but there have been a lot of articles on the list in the 12 months, that the Andrew Tates of this world exist in some sort of splendid isolation, that they are malignant forces that are on the periphery of society. And they're sort of like conspiracy theorists, if you like, the siren call towards their toxicity, if you like, um, is being set up. And boys need to be protected from this. Without the obvious question being asked, why, why would boys be attracted in the first place? Why would young men see Andrew Tate as an answer? And I asked that question this morning of you. Um, I think young men and boys in this country are in danger. And I, can I give it, and, and I, I think that they are routinely discriminated against. I think our school education system, particularly at primary, so the first eight years when they learn all those building blocks of society, that they are discriminated against then at that age. Um, and yet they seem to find their place, not universally, but generally, um, in traditional boys' schools with traditional values where they feel as if they belong. And uh, they get that sort of esprit de corps, if you like, that sense of belonging um, that, you know, the mongrel mob provide to dispossessed Maori youth, for example. Um, mainstream schools tend to provide to everybody else. Your thoughts? 0800 um, 33 2283. Do we have such a thing as toxic masculinity in New Zealand? Or do we have a whole series of young boys and men um, who simply feel as if they are discriminated against by policy uh, and by personality, simply because they're male. Um, you remember in the 1980s and just on that, there was a, a very good, it was very effective actually, um, I didn't mind it, um, public education program called Girls Can Do Anything. Um, a lot of you might have in actual fact been inspired by that. It was, um, the idea was that girls were not going into areas like mathematics, science, uh, engineering, um, medicine, uh, the law, uh, and that they were being confined into areas that they had traditionally been confined in nursing, uh, primary school teaching, um, what else? Rest home assistance, um, shop assistance, things like that. And so the idea was that girls can do anything as a campaign would show girls that in actual fact you can do, nothing's going to stop you. Um, and indeed, there was even positive discrimination. There were some university courses, for example, that let girls have a slightly easier access into them um, in the same way that young Maori might get access into medical or law school these days. Um, but it would seem now that the, the, the revolution is complete, that women can do everything and women have done everything. And I'm not aware of any sexual or sexist discrimination against women. 
um, from in the workplace. I'm, I'm not aware of it. Um, I'm sure there might be individual cases where women are discriminated against by individual men. But as a general rule, um, with, as a society, as a culture, um, I think we all think that women are equal to men, A. B, it should be treated as such, and C, should have the same opportunities and also the same consequence if things go wrong. Do we really think that about boys these days? And, and again, I ask you, if you were dealing with your primary education sector, which if I went back to my primary education sector as a child was 50-50, 50% of the teachers were male, 50% were female. So it was a pretty balanced sector, if you like. And now I'm looking at a sector that's over 90% female, and if they are males at the school, they're generally the school principal, which is ironic, um, or they're the caretaker. But I'm, I'm interested in your thoughts on this this morning. And um, if there is a toxic masculinity, is it because it's a reaction to young boys not knowing their place in society these days, and in young men not having a sense of who they are, and not being aware of that men are different than women, boys, than girls. Um, and on that, and this sort of segues rather nicely into it, overnight in the Times, um, J.K. Rowling has gone on the attack. Um, J.K. Rowling has been, um, as you know, she's the author of Harry Potter, probably the most successful children's literature of the late 20th century. Um, and, early 20th, and early 21st century, she would have been, she's what, the C.S. Lewis, she is the... Enid Blyton of our generation, and she is responsible for large numbers of people who didn't want to read, suddenly reading. Um, and also, you know, some of the great movies of our time as well. Great entertainment, great imagination, great story. Is a single mum living in, I think it was Scotland or the north of England, um, eking her existence out on welfare, writing the first Harry Potter. Uh, brilliant story. Uh, declined, I think, by 20 publishers, her story. Um, so persevered until she finally found one, and the rest, as we say, is history. But J.K. Rowling um, is a feminist. It's not surprising, is it really, given her personal circumstances? Um, she's a believer that women can do everything, and she's gone out there despite adversity, personal and circumstantial, and triumphed. But as you know, J.K. Rowling is now probably one of... You could probably put Andrew Tate and J.K. Rowling in the same mainstream media box, you could probably put them both in the same de-platform unit. Um, you could probably make sure that if they either of them came to New Zealand, um, there would be hundreds of protesters outside demanding that their freedom of speech and thought be denied to you. Um, but anyhow, J.K. Rowling has come out over the weekend, uh, sorry, over the week, uh, last night in the Times, um, the Times in Britain, uh, in London, and said that young teenagers are unable to make decisions about transitioning. Um, having been cauterised, criticised, hounded off most um, public media forums in the United uh, Kingdom, and also not allowed, I think, to step on any university campus. Ironic, isn't it? Here they are. The, the citadels of liberal learning, um, denying someone like UK, uh, J.K. Rowling the right to say anything. But the multi-million uh, dollar, so the multi-million selling author of the Harry Potter series um, has come out and swinging. And she says, I don't think a 14-year-old can ever have the maturity or the awareness or the experience or the understanding to make a decision as to whether or not they're a boy or a girl. Um, at 14, I would have said that I didn't want children, she said. But motherhood has been the most joyful, wonderful thing in my life. I don't believe that even a 40, ever a 14-year-old can truly understand what the loss of fertility might mean to them. And she was talking about <coughs> gender dysphoria, as they call it. I raise this issue because um, J.K. Rowling is making another point. She's making the point that teenagers are teens and that teenagers, at the end of the day, aren't mature enough, don't have the intelligence, the insight, the experience, the life circumstances, the awareness to be able to make considered decisions. And then I add the third trench to this this morning. Two days ago, <coughs> the Prime Minister, Chris Hipkins, specified, and so have various local government leaders, that 16-year-olds should receive the vote. Um, they can't fight in wars, they can't get a mortgage, they can drive a car, 
on a restricted license, to be fair. Um, but that's about all. And um, But they should be allowed to vote and determine um, who runs the country, who runs councils, um, who runs local government institutions and authorities. I put these three stories together for you this morning because the toxic world of the manosphere, is it an actual fact, a reaction to the toxic feminisation of New Zealand and the Western world? J.K. Rowling talking about teenagers um, simply having the inability, intuition, experience or intelligence to be able to make decisions about their gender. And Chris Hipkins saying that 16-year-olds should be allowed to vote because they have a stake in society. Well, so does my dog.